on Blackboard will be open until April 27th for all your speaker series and get, uh, get your write-ups deposited. If we could have the uh, distance ed students, those of you that are would please uh, turn your mics off on your table until the uh, question and answer period. We'd much appreciate it. Creates a little feedback on this end. Okay, I don't uh, have any other announcements to make, so I am going to turn the time over to uh, Ken Snyder, the Executive Dean of uh, the Huntsman School of Business, and he will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dave. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Norman Bodek to all of you tonight. Uh, to give a little bit of background on, on Norman, uh, let me give just a few brief highlights of his career in entrepreneurship and then give you a little bit about his relationship with Utah State. Uh, Norman uh, started life as an accountant and he was one of the co-founders of a company called ADP. How many of you have ever heard of ADP? Do you know what that is? Okay, the largest payroll processing company in the world. Norman can tell you about what he did with his shares of stock in ADP and why. That's a good story. I hope you're going to tell that one, aren't you? <laughs> he sold his stock before it went public. That's why. <laughs> um, and then he started a company called Productivity Press. And in Productivity Press, he started as, with a newsletter, but he caught on to the whole concept of lean. And then he started um, studying Japanese production, particularly the Toyota production system, and ended up turning his company into a publishing firm and training firm in addition to just doing the newsletter. And uh, in, in doing that, he, he trained I don't know how many thousands of executives in lean principles. He also published, I think, around 200 books. Did I get that about right? 450 books, uh, a lot of which he uh, helped uh, with the actual editing of, not just the publishing of. And uh, then he sold that productivity press. I think he'll tell us that story as well. And I think he regrets selling it sooner than maybe he should have. So I hope that's part of the story that he tells us. Um, and then he got bored and he decided to start a third company called PCS Press, which is where he's at right now. So he's been deeply involved with three different startups and, uh, as, as, and as the principal in, in two of them. So I think there's some great entrepreneurship stories as well as, as uh, particularly in the last two, he's been tied in very deeply with, the, with lean operations. Uh, he's sometimes referred to as the father of lean. I mentioned that to him a few minutes ago, or an hour or so ago, when we were meeting with the Lean Leaders Club. And he said, no, I'm no longer the father of Lean. I think I'm the grandfather of Lean now. So, <laughs> um, Norman first became associated with Utah State University when he was working with my predecessor, the person who was the uh, associate dean in charge of administrative affairs at Utah State University, Vern Bueller. And some of you may know Vern. He's, uh, he's from Logan and is cur currently lives in Logan, unfortunately not able to come because he's, he's old and, and sick right now, which is unfortunate. But, but one night, Norman and Vern were talking about uh, what, what should they do to, to introduce the lean concepts to the American, or if you will, Western uh, business culture. And they decided that one of the ways to do that was to start the Shingo Prize. And so they, one night, I believe it's the way the, I've heard it from both of them, is one night over dinner, they pulled out a napkin and started outlining what the Shingo Prize and the Shingo Prize organization might look like. And, and in 1988, uh, due to a gift from Norman that helped launch the Shingo Prize, he donated the money to get it started. Uh, the Shingo Prize was born at Utah State University, continues to be a significant part of the Huntsman School of Business. Matter of fact, our uh, executive director of the Shingo Prize is sitting right here. Thank you for coming, Bob. That's Bob Miller right there. So uh, we have a long, a long relationship with Norman uh, through the Shingo Prize organization, and we've been working very closely with him the last couple of years. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Norman Bodek. Thank you very much. No. We'll fix that. Hold on a sec. Tom will make you louder.
When I was young, that's it, thank you. When I was younger, I could not stand in front of an audience like this and speak. I got up at the University of Wisconsin. It was about seven, eight hundred people in the audience, and I introduced Ogden Nash. Ogden Nash was a very noted poet, comedian uh, in the United States back when I went to college at the University of Wisconsin. And I was on the forum committee, and I'm introducing him to this 700, where are the 700 students here tonight, by the way? I have so many wonderful jokes, and they're not here to listen to them. But they can watch them on video if, you, if, you, if you're listening to them on video. And I wrote a speech, and I memorized the speech. And I'm standing in front of this audience, and I'm so nervous, I couldn't remember anything. Nothing. And I took out the speech and I read it. Look, I had it in my pocket. And then I sat behind Ogden Nash and he's reading these funny, these funny poems and I couldn't even smile. They called me, you know, Mr. Mr. Smiley. Well, Smiley was my, my, my nickname. In fact, I can't smile tonight because I forgot to put my teeth in. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about entrepreneurship. I've been so lucky in my life because I started off as the worst possible student that you could imagine. The worst. The first nine years of school, I never got an A. Not one. Not one outstanding grade. Not one teacher like Norman. And how can you not like Norman? <laughs> I mean, he's so lovable. How can you not? I mean, I wasn't a bad kid. I didn't do anything really bad, but I wasn't a good student. And back then, the teacher loved good students. But you see, I didn't have a mind that could remember. I didn't have a mind that could remember. My wife, she's an encyclopedia. She reads something and she never forgets. Especially if I do something wrong. <laughs> She'll never forget. You know, I forget all the time. I mentioned this this morning with the group, this afternoon with the group. I can repeat this again, I hope, because there's only a small group there. But when you reach my age, I'm going to be 80 this summer. When you get older, you start to forget a little bit, just a little bit. And when I lecture, you've got to bring me back, because I do forget. Well, last year, I gave to maybe 50 different charities, maybe something like that, a lot of charities. And, but I like to send money only once a year to one charity. I do that, those that I like. But somehow, I send four checks to the Alzheimer Association. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot lucky for them, but it shows you where I am in my life. I, is, Norman, how did you remember that you sent those checks to the Alzheimer's? Because I'm, I'm making because I'm making my tax return this oh. week. I have to get it filed by Sunday. So I started off. Oh, I like this. I mentioned in, in this class, this first, what was the first man's name? Mitra? You looked it up. You yeah, remember? Sugata. Yeah, Sugata Mitra. Yeah. And he, he, I would recommend you go to YouTube and you see this video by this man. And he, he calls what he does the hole in the wall. And it's absolutely, we're talking about entrepreneurship. And this is amazing. India needs so much in the field of education. I mean, they do have a hundred million very highly educated people, but over a, a billion that has no education. So how are we going to educate, especially women? They're not educated at all. And so what he's done, he's worked with companies, and they give him computers, very cheap, inexpensive computers, and he can, puts it in a hole in the wall, and they connect to the Internet. They connect to the Internet. And he gets four students, and he puts them in front of the terminal, and he said, I want you to learn on your own with no teacher. He shows them how to use the computer, and then he says to these students, I want you to learn English. And he comes back three months later, and they're speaking the King's English. Isn't this amazing? How many teachers are in the room? How many teachers are in the room? There are a few, not too many. There are some, sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying we, we are superfluous. We don't need them anymore. This can, and another thing I loved about this, what he said, and you're not laughing with me. I mean, don't take it seriously. 
<laughs> and, so, um, and it's, it's <laughs> with, what, I, what I love what he said is he said, why do you need a memory when you got Google? I wish I had Google when I was young. Then I wouldn't be criticized with my memory because the teachers used to give me things, go home, Norman, and do this assignment and come back and we'll get a test tomorrow. Did you learn your assignment? Well, I'd go home and I'd read the assignment. I did read it, but it never stuck up here. It just doesn't stick here. I've studied maybe six languages. It doesn't stick here. My wife is so critical of me. She's Japanese, but I can't remember anything in Japanese. But I studied Japanese, but I don't know Japanese. Not like this genius over here who speaks Japanese so well. OK, I want to talk about entrepreneurship. I want to give you something real tonight, real, that will really help you in your life. My life has been a miracle. I've been totally blessed. Maybe I should start there. I was going to, you got to remind me of this. I want to come back that you pick something to be the best in the world at. Okay? I want you to write that down. I want, I want to come back <laughs> to that. He was in the last session and wrote it down then. Okay, I want you to pick something that the best in the world at. <laughs> I just want to tell you the following. You, everyone in this room, has an amazing connection with this infinite creative universe. You have a direct link to everything. You only have to learn how to use it, how to open to it. You have a direct link with everything. You are. You are everything. In this mind, you think you're separate from everything, but that's just your illusion. We have to get rid of that illusion so that you realize you're in touch with this universe and it will give you everything just the way it's given me everything. I have got, what's your name? Sam. Sam, I have, that's my father's name. It's a good name. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a good name. I have gotten everything from this universe that you could imagine. I can't think of anything that I have not gotten. I've been to 52 different countries. I just came back from my 80th trip to Japan, believe it or not. 80 trips to Japan. I have a million miles on American. I have 985,000 miles on Delta. So in a couple of months, I'll have a million on Delta. About 970,000 on United and plus all the other airlines, maybe at least 4 million miles in my life in traveling. So you have to be very careful. And what I'm going to do tonight is try to have you plant seeds within yourself so that it can grow and manifest whatever you want. And somehow when I was a child, because I was such a poor student, I planted a seed, I want to get away from this. I had a terrible home life. How do I get away from this? I have a terrible home life because I wasn't born a Mormon. <laughs> if I was born a Mormon, I would have had a great home life. I'd have at least four other siblings. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> I only have one brother. <laughs> Funny what you're capable of doing if you learn how to tap into this universal energy that's available to you. What I'd recommend to you, and this is non-sectarian, non-denominational, but I recommend every one of you learn how to meditate. Every one of you should learn how to meditate. I've been meditating for 40 years. And so I have a need. I have a need, say, today. I have a need. I have a problem I can't resolve. I just sit quietly tomorrow morning for 30 minutes, and the answer comes to me. It always comes to me. All I have to do is, so in my life, I have to do two things. One is be open to this universal energy so it will feed me. And what do you think the second thing is I have to do? What do I have to do to take advantage of this creative spirit? Act, what do I have to do? Listen, what do I have to do? Of course. He's very smart. What it, what it, what it means, is, that's Musashi Miyamoto. Musashi Miyamoto was the greatest warrior in Japan. The greatest warrior. He won 60 battles and never lost. And they said to him, Musashi, why? What did you do to never lose a battle? He's only did two things. Two things I do. One is I perfect my style, and two, is I polish my soul. Perfect my style means you're building yourself into the greatest artisan that you possibly can be. In order to do that, 
you've got to go back to the word that he's going to help me on, which is to be the best in your life. You have to pick something that you want to be the best at. How many of you know in the room what you want to do the rest of your life to be successful at? Raise your hand. Look around the room. I mean, this is a lot more than I normally get, by the way. I very rarely get this. I had 80 students. I teach at Portland State University. I had 80 students last year. I didn't get one hand to pop up. Not one. My current class is 26 students. I got two hands yesterday. I taught last night. Two students knew what they wanted to do. One wants to open up his own car repair business. I said, what are you going to college for to open a college repair business? So I learned, so I, he says, so I'll know how to run the business. Well, that's pretty smart. And the other one wants to make video games. That's very good, too. If you don't pick your goal to go somewhere, where are you going? Now, how are you going to get there? Now, why spend all this money in college if you don't know what you're going to do with it? To me, it's so silly. You're going to graduate college, right? And you're going to go to a company, and you want the company to hire you, and you take an interview, Sam, right? And they're going to say to you, what do you want to do in our company? What are you going to tell them? I don't know. Sam was one of them who raised his hand. That he did know. That he, that he did know. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. <laughs> That's because I you knew your name. I don't know any, any of the other names. OK, Charlie. <laughs> Nate. He's Nate. He's Nate. He's Nate. He raised his hand too. He raised, how about you? Yeah. I'll pretend like I did. We talked about this. In the we did it early, okay. Okay, Smiley, what's your name? Huh? Adrian. And what do you want to be? Still up in the air a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to know till you grow up, is that it? Well, I thought I was going to be like a good idea. What? Is what? How? That's good. That's good. Pick something that you want to be the best in the world at. I want to be the best in the world at. I'm devoted to it. I want to be the best in the world teaching teachers how to teach students how to be successful in life. That's one thing I want to do. I want to teach teachers how to teach students how to be successful in life. I want to teach managers how to teach employees how to be successful in life. Look at the average company in America. I mean, what we need are such great opportunities for you because we're going to such a dynamic shift right now in the universe. Such a shift. It's amazing what opportunities you will have out there because we've been in the last hundred and 20 years of Taylorism. We've been in 100 years of the Ford Motor concept. Do you know what I mean? Is how do we simplify work? How do we take these people and put them on a factory line and have them do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again? And that's their life. That's 95% of the people now that are working. They're doing boring, repetitive work. Now, you be honest with me, all of you. Be honest with me. What's the best day of the week? Friday. Saturday. You didn't have to work on Friday. Have to still work. Okay, Friday's up to Saturday. Saturday. Oh, now raise your hand. Who loves Monday? One, two, three. Not two men. Not two men. Why do you like Monday? You start your workout. Okay, so you got a purpose. You know what you're doing. That's okay. It, it's just, if you pick something that you're in love with, then you're going to love every single day. There's no difference in the one day the next. No difference. I mean, I don't, I don't know Sundays. I don't know Saturdays. I don't know Fridays. The only difference is, is the phone doesn't ring as often, you know what I mean, on the weekend as it does during the week. It doesn't ring that much anyway <laughs> during the week anyway. This is the funny thing about my life, you know, because I go out of my way to meet every genius that I can <coughs> in two fields. I want to meet the greatest geniuses in management, and I have. Dr. Ducker, I mean, Peter Drucker, and, and Dr. Deming, and et cetera. I go out of my way to meet these great geniuses in the field of management, especially in Japan. 
I published 100 Japanese books in English. The greatest, I published Shingo, I published Ono, all of the greatest ones if we study anything about Japanese management. And I also go out into the world to try to find the best spiritual teacher. And I told you, I sat next to one of your elders. What a beautiful man. What an amazing man. In order to be an elder, you just have to, you know, I mean, you have to be at that level of magnetism. What a, what a fabulous man. And that's what I do. I go around the world trying to meet the best of everything. That's my job, so I can teach it. What I want to teach now is the culmination of what I've done in my life. I started off being the worst. I only read three books before I graduated uh, high school. Only three books. I was probably dyslexic and didn't know it. I couldn't read, and I ended up publishing 450 of them. I think that's ironical. It's a cosmic joke. <laughs> <laughs> Using Norman. But I let it use me. It's not easy. It, I, I, I'll tell you, it's never easy what it wants me to do. But I don't care, I'll do it. My teacher, I had one great teacher, his name was Rudy, and Rudy said, Norman, if there's a harder way, I should write this down, if there's a harder way to do it, show me, because I want to do it because I know it's going to be wonderful. If there's a harder way, it's going to be wonderful. Because if it's a harder way, then I'm going to learn from it. It's an opportunity. The only thing hard is something that you haven't done. Just think of it. Everything you've done in your life repeatedly is easy. Do you do anything over and over again? I mean, just think. You eat every day, don't you? You, you eat every day? Yeah. Is it difficult? Nope. Could you imagine what the body is doing with this little simple act of eating? How many trillions of cells are interacting precisely to take the stuff that you put in your mouth and try to convert it into something that's useful? Especially when you go to McDonald's. <laughs> well, what a challenge <laughs> that you're giving the human body, which is so magnificent and so perfect. Okay, we want to be entrepreneurs. You can pick, literally, you can pick anything you want, and you devote yourself to it, and you could attain it. I was watching mentioned this earlier too, I'm watching the um, Olympic trials in Japan, the swimming Olympic trials. trials. I just came back from Japan on Sunday. It's been an interesting week, because I'm still on jet lag. I came back Sunday, I taught last night, quite late. My class ended up about nine o'clock. And where was I before I just drifted? Bring me back. Huh? I'm swimming, oh you're so sweet. <laughs> and I'm looking at these people that are competing, right? And how do they look? What's different about them than us? Their shoulders are massive. Their chests are massive. Not, not this way, you know. <laughs> massive this way. They're massive. And their arms. And how long did it take them to condition their body to come to that place so they can compete for the Olympics? Their whole life. They're dedicated to something. But it's something meaningful. Even if they don't make it, they've made it. I mean, even if they don't go to the Olympics, they've made it in their life by, 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 by working that tenaciously on something to succeed. They can't fail. You know, once you learn to get that mechanism directed, you can't fail. You just pick something else. So most of us are worried about picking something to be successful because you might pick what? The wrong thing. So it's better to pick nothing and do nothing than to pick the wrong thing. This is part of our school system because I'm really down on the school system. We got to really turn this thing around somehow. And I'm a teacher. We have to turn around the whole school system, really, because it's our fault that we don't give the people the opportunity to be great. We don't. They didn't do it with me when I was a child. I mean, they would give me a test. And what does a test mean when they give me a test? What are they testing? They're testing my ignorance. Every time I made a mistake, my grade went down. I always made mistakes, because how do I learn? You make a mistake and you learn from it. Isn't that true? The primary way a human being learns is by making mistakes. That's the way we learn. We copy and we make mistakes. 
And yet you go to school and every time you make a mistake, your grade goes down. So what they do is they just kill your creativity. They just kill it. I did a study once. They did a study once in America of 240,000 Americans, and they found out that only 2% are considered to be highly creative. How many of you in this room consider yourself to be highly creative? Raise your hand. Highly creative. Quite a bit more than 2%. This is unusual. That's because you're Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> At age, at age, I don't know, at age three, 100% of the children, virtually 100% of the children are highly creative. At the end of kindergarten, it drops to 95%, according to this study. At the end of first grade, it drops to 10%. And the end of the second grade, it drops to the national average of 2% of the children are considered to be highly creative. How can you go to school, which should be a fully creative process, and they kill the creativity in you? We have to change this whole system of education. I'm on a new challenge, a new direction. One of the things that I want from all of you, especially in the educational field, is that if somebody graduates high school, they must have a skill. How can you graduate high school and you can't make a living? I can't understand that. How can you graduate high school and not have a living? When I was younger, I hardly ever saw a bum. I never saw anybody panhandling when I was young. Never. Maybe when I went down to the Bowery, there was one street in Manhattan on the Bowery, and you could see some of the people were looking for handouts. Now you go to any corner. I live near Portland, Oregon, and every street corner has somebody with a handout. Do you have any in, in uh, Salt Lake City? Yes. How can that be? How can it be? It's crazy. In this society, the richest, it's, we're still the richest country in the world. We're quickly losing it, but we're, I think we're still the richest country in the world. We're talking about entrepreneurship. And in my life, I was blessed. I was an accountant. Quickly left that. That was such a blessing. <laughs> Not being an accountant anymore. And, and I was so lucky that I automated accounting. I mean, I was in India not too long ago, a few years ago, and I turned to astrology, and he looked at me, and he said, Norman, you should have been the richest man in the world. And he's a great astrologer because he told me everything about my past, everything about my future. He said, you should have been the richest, I should have been the richest man in the world. I was the first one in the world to automate accounting. Now, I was a terrible student, and I became an accountant at the worst, my father. I went to my father. Why I went to work with my father, I don't know, but I did. And it was the worst accounting practice in America. My father never graduated high school and had an accounting practice. He just told the world he was an accountant and everybody believed it. <laughs> it's funny what you can do in this life. You know, and he served his clients very well. He studied very hard, but he never told them he never graduated high school. He became an accountant. I went to work with him and we had a Terrible practice. We used to take these checks, and I'd sit, you know, with these shades on, and you'd, you'd, you'd put all the checks down, you know, the name of the check and the amount of the check, and you had to put it in the right column. Then you had to add it up. I couldn't be off a penny, not one penny, in, in working for him. And it occurred to me, within three years, I had a totally automated practice. And then I left. I said, Dad, you don't need me anymore. And I, and I left this practice because it was totally automated. But I wasn't very smart with that ADP deal <laughs> at all. And I left. It's funny. I know, I know how to get, it triggers in me how to get started. I don't know how to sustain it. I need help. I had thousands of shares at Apple. And then this guy invites me to go to Japan. And I said, um, I want to get out of the stock market going to Japan. And I sold all my Apple stock. And I didn't keep it. Today, they're worth $600 billion. Right? If you, I don't want to count what I lost. <laughs> but opportunity is always there. It's always there for you. If you stay open enough, it's always there. And if you're willing to work exceptionally hard for it, there's no easy road. 
Even if your parents are very, very rich, that's not easy for you to overcome that. And then I went into um, offshore. It's another funny thing. I'm making a lot of claims. I like this. I don't want to exaggerate too much. And I don't want to lie. Not at all. But I was one of the first in the world to do offshore anything. Now it's big in India and big in China. You can blame me. I had an offshore company in 1965. I, had, I sent work from the United States to Barbados. And in Barbados, I had 200 data entry operators working for companies in America. And in America, the data entry operator maybe got $5 an hour. In Barbados, they got, what, 50 cents or 40 cents? And so, in one sense, I was exploiting them. But in another sense, I felt good because I gave them work. And I made sure that I paid them more than where, anywhere else they could work on the island. So I got the cream of the crop when I worked there. But I didn't stick with that business. And I knew it was going to mushroom. It had a mushroom because of the differential in labor rates within America and the rest of the world and the advent of technology. With the internet, you can do anything in India that we can do right here, except operate on my body. They haven't figured out how to do that yet remotely. There's such opportunities for you if you just stay open. But the first thing you have to do is what? What? That's it. That's up to you. I can give you a method how to take that and be successful with it and guarantee your success. I will guarantee your success 100% of your money back. You have to be successful with this method because it works absolutely correctly. I got it from a genius called Harada and we met Harada a couple of years ago on a trip to Japan. This, is, this man is such a genius. He was a junior high school teacher and he had the worst school in the city of Osaka. Out of 380 schools, his school was rated the lowest. It was in the slums. In fact, I said, uh, I said, Harada, I saw him last week, and I said, what was your actual rating in your school when you took over? And he says, Norman, we weren't even rated, we were so bad. And two years later, they become number one. And 13 of his students won gold medal. 13 of his students became the number one athlete in all of Japan. And his school, for the last 12 years, has been the number one junior high school in Osaka out of 380 schools. What did he do? What magic did he do to uplift the worst school? Just imagine. I mean, you were, you're going to a great school. But just imagine you're going to this school and every one of you leave and you're superior, you know, whatever you pick in the world. And that's possible. It's possible to you. Then about 1979, I started a company called Productivity, also Productivity Press. And the reason I started that company is because um, I was the president of this data processing company. We had a facility in Barbados and we had a facility in Grenada. I was in Grenada about eight years, and I didn't really like what I was doing at all, and so I left. And it was August 13th, I'm reading the New York Times. I remember August 13th because my birthday is August 12th. And so this creative energy gave me a gift, an incredible gift on this Monday morning, which was the 13th. And it said on the business section, American productivity declined for the first time in 33 quarters. And I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what productivity meant at that moment. I do now, because I started a company called Productivity. But I didn't know what productivity meant. But for some strange reason, I was curious. I wasn't working, so I went to the library. And I don't go to libraries. I never liked libraries. And I think the reason I never liked libraries is because one day my father said to me, Norman, I borrowed a book from the library and I forgot to return it and the policeman showed up at the house. The policeman came to the house to try to get the book back from my father. You see, back then, police did wonderful things. Not what they do today, you know, giving you traffic tickets and speeding tickets and terrible things like that. 
I mean, what's the job of a policeman? He should, he should, you know, have a, he should have a little box of chicken soup or something to help people out. We're a little bit mixed up what we do. We, so I was blessed. I looked up the word productivity and I saw that I became fascinated with the word productivity because fundamentally productivity is a wonderful word. It means as a group of people, we are creating more to share. That's why it's so wonderful. As you improve productivity with the same resources or less resources, right? You're creating more goods and services to make a better life for everyone. If you look around us today and go back 200 years and see the way we live, the difference is productivity improvement. We keep doing things easier and better and creating better lives for all of us, supposedly, if we do it correctly. And we have to learn how to do it correctly, not to exploit each other. And so it was a fabulous journey with me. I started with a newsletter, decided to write a news, publish a newsletter, and then I found out Japan was the productivity growth leader in the world, and so I went to Japan. Not knowing anything about Japan. I mean, I didn't speak the language, didn't know anybody there, but I had the gumption to go to Japan to try to figure out what are you doing to be the best in the world. They were the best in the world in productivity growth. While America was negative, they were up about 9%, something like that. What were they doing that we're not doing? And I went to find out. It's funny, a teacher of mine said, go to Japan and find out. And I said, how am I going to find out? And he said to me, something wonderful. And this is what a teacher should do, by the way. The teacher should say to the student, you figure it out. That was beautiful words to me. He said, you figure it out. And it came to me. It was amazing. A couple of months later, I go to a conference from industry. Industry Week has been a good luck charm for me. Because in the, I went to this conference with Industry Week, and Joe Girai is speaking. Joe Girai is the manager of the American the Japanese Productivity Center in Washington. And he's giving a speech, and about 100 people in the audience, and he wanted American companies to let Japanese managers come in to look at American plants to help Japanese industry. And Americans were very gracious people, tremendously gracious, because we opened the door and let everybody in. Now it's very hard to go to Japan and get in. Somehow they do it on their study missions. But it's not easy to get a Japanese company to accept you today. Not the way you, it was in reverse with us. And um, I went to Japan, and I found all of these incredible geniuses. And I meet, meet Dr. Ryuji Fukuda, and Fukuda, I really liked him. He was a great speaker on my first study mission. I went to Japan on a study mission in 1981. Joji Arai, after he spoke, I said to him, Joji, would you do the reverse? would you let me take a group to Japan to study Japanese management? And he said, yes, and he did. He set up my first study mission. And I did about 52 of them. I did two with Bob. Um, I did about, I don't know, 52, 54 study missions in my life that I set up at Productivity. And the company grew. And one of the reasons it grew, by the way, this is funny, if I ever went to my father and ask for something, what do you think my father said? What? No. I never heard my father say yes. I'm sincere. I never heard my father say yes. Always said no. It's like your boss. How many of you work? Yeah. You ever go to your boss and say, I got something new, I, I think we really should do it in the company? What does your boss say? <laughs> He's unusual. Normally the boss says it's not in the budget. Right. Oh, he says that. Says it's not in the budget. <laughs> he says that too. But then he says, so if you can, if you can cover it yourself and make it revenue you know, neutral or better, then go for it. Okay, well, then he's, he's exceptional right? because right? that's what a boss should say. A boss should say, look, what we don't do, this is a funny thing too. You go to college, who's paying for your college education? You or your parents, primarily. Or you're borrowing money to get educated, right? And then you go work for a company, 
And why does the process stop? Why does it stop? You go to a company and you expect the company to pay for your education in the future. Isn't that true? You, you, you expect the company to invest in you. Good luck. They do it very rarely. I mean, if you're related to somebody at top, you know what I mean? If you're really super exceptional, then maybe they will invest in you and help you get an MBA or something like that. But, it, but it's really rare in America today, investing in people. That's a shame. I was mentioning this earlier, the real problem, because accountants created that problem. And I was an accountant early. And we created the problem because if you look at a balance sheet, you'll, you will not see people on a balance sheet. If I invest in a piece of machinery, I'll put it on the balance sheet. If I invest in a stock, I put it on the balance sheet, right? This is what goes on a balance sheet. If I make inventory, it goes on the balance sheet. Even though Ono said inventory is, is an evil, the accountant says, look, it's not an evil, put it on the balance sheet. And the bankers said to you, you got inventory, that's wonderful, we'll lend you money. But if you go to the bank and say, look, I got the 10 sharpest, greatest people in the world working for me, is the bank gonna give you money? It's nuts what we do, it's upside down. In that they don't invest in you and, and your possible talent. And so I was very lucky. I went to Japan and I found these geniuses and I found Fukuda and Fukuda says, I wrote this book and I said, I'll publish the book. You see, because my father always said no, I'm like Ken, I always say yes. Remember from now on he has to say only yes. <laughs> I only say yes. And so I started this productivity by myself with a newsletter and within 10 years, I had 127 people. I was up to 16 million in sales. I made $2 million in one year. Now be careful, anybody in the IRS in this room, be careful repeating this. I made $2 million in one year. I didn't know what to do with the money. I just didn't know what to do with the money. I'm trying to build a building here. Well, you, know <laughs> <laughs> you, you stay, stay close to me because it's coming again. All right. It is coming because what I'm teaching now is absolutely the best methodology for people to be successful. You want to be entrepreneur, to be successful. The first step is you have to pick a goal of what you want to achieve. And then you say to yourself, you want to be the best in the world at it, not less. You want to win the Olympics in that particular discipline. If you're a writer, you want to get the Nobel Prize. If you're a chemist, you want to get the Nobel Prize. You know what I mean? You want to be the best in the world at what you do, and you've got to tell yourself you're willing to pay the pain to get it. There's a direct relationship between, between Harada just gave this to me, and Harada said, I met him in Japan, and he gives me this chart, and in the chart, it's... Um, can I get... Can I remember this? This, this is uh, difficulty. And this is, um, trying to get this. You know what I mean? This is something to do with success up here. Not exactly the word he used, but I'm trying to remember what this is. Difficulty, developing a skill, something like that. Yeah, you're, you're something like that. I'm trying to remember exactly the word up here. But, but the relationship is, if you are increasing your value, there'll be a direct correlation to how difficult it is to attain the spot that you want, which is right there. It's always going to be difficult if you're going out to challenge new things. And so you're going to recognize that difficulty and you have to be committed to overcome the difficulty that might be in front of you. I know that's always there with me, but I'm very lucky because I meditate. And so when it's really rough today, I sit tomorrow morning and it tells me what to do. Now, who is it? Who is it? Who is telling me something? Who is it? 
I didn't bring it down. I should have brought it down. But I read an amazing phrase in the New York Review of Books. I really liked it. Here it is. Here it is. I taught last night, my first class of this term, and I had three Abdullahs in the class from Saudi Arabia. I had three of them. And I just read this. It's an article in the New York Review of Books on the, on the Kaaba. Do you know what the Kaaba is? Who knows what the Kaaba is? You know, what's the Kaaba? Oh, you're so smart. What are you here at the school? Are you a student or a teacher? What? <laughs> Norman, he is our business school senator, elected by the student body to be the head business school. Well, you can see it right away. The Representative I mean, he is, to our student leadership. He is exceptionally bright. He is exceptionally bright. The Kaaba is this black stone that sits in Mecca. And in October, about two and a half million people are going to walk around that stone, what, seven times? Something like that. They're going to walk around, I think it's seven times. They're going to walk around that stone. Now, why are they walking around that stone? I like this. Why are they walking around that stone? You know? What? You should know this. I mean, you should know more things than just Mormonism. You've got to learn other things, Bob. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. That's right. That's what the Mormon, the, the, the Islamics believe. That's the rock that that uh, that Abraham was going to slice up his son, Isaac. <laughs> so what's the purpose of walking? What's the purpose of walking around this? Seven times. What's the purpose of walking around seven times? Why do you want to do it? Why, why do they want you to walk around seven times? Who knows? I didn't know till yesterday. <laughs> I love this because we have such, in this society today, because of the, the terrorism and all the other things that goes on in the news, we have such a negative perception about Islam. It's a shame, because what I'm reading to you is so wonderful that it should give you a whole new perspective of what the Islamic religion is all about. I never knew this before. These people walk around the Kaaba, K-A apostrophe A-B-A. They walk around to forget yourself. Write that down. They walk around to forget yourself. Now, why do you want to forget yourself? Who's going to tell me? Yes. Well, that's good. Why do you want to forget yourself? Why do you want to forget yourself? He's close. Yeah. If we are always thinking of ourselves, not being able to see the value that's around in the universe. Of course. Yeah. You get in the way of everything. Your ego gets in the way of everything. What you think the reality is, is not the reality. So what they're saying is we want to walk around this to totally forget yourself. And then he says, you have been transformed into a particle. By walking around, you have been transformed into a particle that is gradually melting and disappearing. You have been transformed into a particle that is gradually melting and disappearing. And this is absolute love at its perk. This is absolute love at its perk. The highest part of any religion is love. That's the highest part of every religion. That's the fundamental of every single universe, is to love each other, is, to, is absolute love. And absolute love, you're not there. When a mother serves a child, the mother is not there. The child gets everything it wants. Everything. The mother is there totally to serve that child out of love. What do you get back from the child? You're lucky if you get a little, little giggle. <laughs> I love what I read. I hope you enjoy it too because the real goal in life for all of us is to melt and disappear. 
and to allow this creative energy to really come into you and use you. Ask me some questions. Yeah, no, we have about five, ten minutes left. Ask me some questions. Just let's see if we can get some questions going. Ask me some questions. I'm sure you didn't expect that kind of talk when you came. <laughs> I hope it's practical for you. We all kinds of talks. Okay, good. So let me ask you a question to get this started. Why did you sell poetry? Just keep doing it. There are so many mistakes that I made in life. Like somebody convinced me that when you reached age 65, you should retire. So... You seem incredibly unconvinced. Well, but I, I retired for two years at age 65. And at the end of two years, this is a funny story, because in August of 1998, I was offered $9 million for productivity. And six months later, I gave it away. Literally gave it away because I let other people run the company, and it was gone. I made a terrible mistake, who I turned it over to, and, and I thought I had so much money, I just got on an airplane and I traveled. I went to India, I went everywhere. I just, you know, I'm retired, I'm going everywhere. I sh I, the retirement wasn't bad, but I should have sold the company first and then, and then left, you know, instead of turning the company over to somebody else. And that's the reason I lost productivity. Shame because it was worth a gold mine it is today. It's still those books alone. I had a consulting company. I had a, you know, we did study missions. We did, we did uh, so many different things. But the book company alone was worth multi, multi, multi millions of dollars. Yes. Norman, I know over the years your contact lists of people that you have met and known have become a really valuable part of your, of your assets. Yes. And I'm wondering if you could make some comments about that. And it's true. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Come. Well, uh, it's difficult for me to use, you know, use the word "use" in example. But I should stay open. Like yesterday, I called Ray Floyd. Ray Floyd is senior vice president at Suncor. And um, we've known each other for because he went and study was study mission with me in 1983, and from that study mission, he just went up the ladder at. Uh, at Exxon, became a senior vice president of Exxon and then retired and got this job at, at the Suncor. And I called him yesterday because I said, I have something marvelous for Suncor and I hope you give me the opportunity to serve you. And I hope he did. I, I went up there in October and I spoke to 90 of his people about what I have. And I think I have something that could save them multi, multi millions of dollars. And I already told him to go for the Shingo Prize. <laughs> Oh, okay, good. I told him to go after the prize. Um, but I'll tell you, with these contacts, it's funny. I've met at least 100 CEOs of American corporations. American Airlines, and Southwest Airlines, and, and uh, you name it, Holiday Inns. Because every conference that I ran, I would have a CEO speak at the conference. This is funny, because when I started productivity, I didn't know anybody. And I wanted to run a conference. And I knew if I had a conference, if I had three key people, if I got a CEO of a American corporation, and if I got a union leader and a politician, then I can get 40 people as speakers for nothing, and I'd get hundreds of people to come. That was my formula. So I needed three to start off with. But I don't know anybody. Didn't know anybody. I was in data processing. I get a phone call from Joe Schneider. What an amazing man, Joe Schneider. Joe calls me the phone and says, Norman, I love your newsletter. How can I help you? I've never gotten this before. How when are you going to pick up the phone and call Norman and say, how can I help you? I'm waiting. I'm waiting for that phone call. He called me on the phone. He said, how can I help you? I'm only kidding. He, and he called me up on the phone. And I said, Joe, I need a CEO of a major corporation, a union leader, and a politician. And he says, OK. He calls me a week later, and he says, Norman, I got you Michael Rose, the CEO of the Holiday Inns. At that time, Holiday Inns was the largest hotel chain in the world, by far. I got you Michael Rose, the CEO. I got you Don Eflin. Don 
is the second highest in the automotive union, UAW. He's in charge of the Ford Motor Company account, and he'll speak for you for nothing, both for nothing. And then it just happened that I had a connection to Stan Lundin. Stan was a congressman upstate New York, and we got him to speak. So I had three key people, which allowed me to get 40 great speakers, which allowed me to have a wonderful conference. And then I ran, confer I ran 10 conferences a year. I had 1,000 people at my last conference before I left productivity. My subject was TPM. $1,000 a person and $1,000 each. And yeah, I mean, Norman does this. He starts, he has the Midas touch, but he doesn't know how to stay with it. There's always something else, you know, something else more, more attractive to me. It's a funny thing. Questions? Only had, yes. Um, this is maybe a bit more uh, visionary, but what what would you what would you say is your goal for the work that you're doing now in terms of the impact on uh, the re the youth and the other people you interact with? What, what I'm trying to do. What's your name again? Rice. Rice. I want you to be the best in the world. That's what I'm giving you tonight. If you start to think about that, you want to be the best in something. I can't think of any greater gift that I could give somebody. Because once it clicks in your head, then you call me and say, Norman, what do I do next? What do I do next? It's so easy. I write this down. One, you pick a goal. You must pick a goal because you'll never get there without a goal. Right? You'll never get there. You'll flounder in the ocean unless you have a goal where to go. You pick a goal. The second thing you want to do is you must need to have a very strong purpose. Very strong purpose and value. Why do we want that goal? And that purpose should be for you, your family, and the community that you're part of. It should not just be for you. I want to make you truly self-reliant. This is what Harada has taught me. I want you to be truly self-reliant. I want you to be an upstanding moral character. So his students just didn't get gold medals in track and field. They were upstanding people. Almost every one of them got into college and they never got into college before because they became self-reliant. They became honest and trustworthy and all the other things that we call self-reliant. And how do we teach self-reliance in America? This is an opportunity for you. We don't do it. Pick up the phone and call AT&T and what are they going to say to you as soon as they pick up the phone? What do you hear? This recording. this recording is what? Is copied, is recorded for quality. for quality purposes. Whose quality? Mine? No. Why? They don't trust their people. If I trust you, do I have to record you? Do you know any CEO of any company that's going to record Except Nixon, he made a terrible mistake. <laughs> we don't do that. We don't trust our people. We don't make them self-reliant. And so it cost at and a fortune. It is so ridiculous. So they don't know what to do with it, these executives. So who's doing customer service now? If people pick up the phone, they're in the Philippines. They're in India now. Do you know what I mean? We're giving it away because we don't know how to deal with it. How can you give away the first person that relates to your customer? It's nuts. AT&T is magnificent today. Ten years from now, AT&T is no longer in business. They went through it once. Twice, break, the breakup. This is true in American industry. There was an old saying when I was younger, as, as, as GM goes, so goes so goes the U.S., right? GM went bankrupt, and we're following on. <laughs> any any we'll more? Take one last question. Let's go. Anyone? Did I fully tell you, you've got to be the best. How do you do it? That's it. You start along the road to be the best. Get a strong purpose. Then look at yourself. Analyze your strengths and your weaknesses. What are you very good at? Continue that. What are you not good at? That's what you have to learn. Then you've got to pick tasks. What are you going to do? We, have, we teach 64 tasks. You do, you'll pick 64 things that you have to do to attain your goal, and then you pick 10 of them that I'm going to do this month. And then from the 10, you'll take three of them that I'm going to do today. And then you make sure you do it today. You've got to do it today. In order to make sure you do it today, what do you need? 
you need a coach. You need a teacher. You need a boss. You need somebody that's going to make sure that you do it. Yeah, some, somebody, we do such foolish things. Everybody needs a coach. But we don't, we don't get coaches. The ego gets in the way. I can do it on my own. I try to learn how to play golf on my own, and all I can do is a hook and a shank, or a shank and a hook. <laughs> Couldn't do anything else. And so I'm, I'm out there. I have to play golf every week because I'm a big shot. I had a big company. I had to play golf. So every Thursday I play golf, and on the weekend I play golf, and I got to go out there playing golf. But I couldn't play golf. But I'm not going to take a lesson. My ego would have take 10 years, 15 years later, I meet John Schley. John Schley, John Schley was a pro. He won the Hawaiian Open. He came in second in the U.S. Open to Johnny Miller. Johnny Miller broke the record, and John Schley didn't win the U.S. Open that year. And John Schley took me out for one hour. One hour. And all the shanks and all the hooks disappeared. Imagine how I felt. One hour of a lesson. I could have been a golfer. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.